so. Okay, we're recording. Yep, and we're going to Hawaii and Maui and May. <laughs> Keeping our fingers crossed, thinking positive thoughts. Have fun. Yeah, well, we haven't seen our family. We haven't, our grand. Oh, it says months. We can get rid of that. Oh, the phone, John. John, yeah. get rid of the phone. Okay, no, it's one o'clock. Are you ready to, the, for us to admit people? Okay, okay, Camila, let's let's uh, let people in. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're letting up more people in today. Oh, I'm to see all of you. you will Hello. Be Hello. I know we've got to mute it to avoid the uh, background noise. Okay, so I'm connected. Thank you. Hi. That's Judith, right? That's Judith. Thank you. Thank, Thank Hi, you. Hi, Michelle. Hi. So many familiar faces. So we'll make just a few more seconds, let more people. Oh my gosh, I have not seen some of these people in like two years or a year. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. We have an exciting talk today. Andrew Powers. Hello, Andrew. Okay, so I know Diane has a lot to say today. So why don't we get yes. started? And if you're seeing all the little boxes, it means that you're in gallery view. And once Diane starts speaking, I, I suggest you go to speaker that. view so that she can take over your screen. And she'll be sharing photographs. And with her today, uh, we have uh, her husband, John. So um, they're saying hi right there. John, do you want to say something before we get started? I thought I would just like to tell the people that uh, we have not learned PowerPoint. Instead, we're using Google Photos. So it'll, for Diane's point of view, it'll be just like a slideshow. And that might give the rest of you some courage to uh, do what she's doing right now. Or not. <laughs> So let me tell you a little bit about Diane. We're so lucky to have her here. Diane holds an undergraduate degree from Boston University, a master's degree in history from Stanford, and another master's in information and library science from Berkeley. She worked in local libraries and volunteered with numerous local organizations. Diane has lectured extensively on Jewish history, particularly the role of women during the gold rush era. For many years, Diane was known as Miss Susanna, going into schools as a time traveler from the 19th century and describing the trip out west by wagon train in life in the 1850 in California. She has also lectured locally on the subject of housework, which began with her collection of antique irons. So uh, let's hold the questions till the end. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the chat and then I will read them to Diane uh, towards the end of her presentation. So Diane, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Well, I'm happy to see so many of you here, especially people that I haven't seen in one or two years, and that makes me very happy. Um, before we start, let me answer a couple of questions which I'm always asked. And I think Michelle answered one of them is, how did I get started? It was with the antique iron collection, which is about 85 irons, which I inherited from my mother. So once you start talking about irons, then you talk about washing machines and then refrigerators and you get the whole story. So that's where that started. And then the second question is, how do I feel personally about housework? I can tell you that I am absolutely beyond thrilled to be living at Mulgau, where somebody comes in to, uh, for housekeeping and John and I get our meals um, right here. He gets his meat meals, I get my vegetarian meals. So it's worked out very well. But on the other hand, after every lecture, somebody comes up to me and says, actually, I really like doing housework. That's fine. I just want to show you what the options were for women. So we're going to go from ooh, the early 1900s to 1950. And for those of you who wax nostalgic over the 1950s, you may have a slightly different point of view after this lecture. We'll see. And I also want to say, if you looked at the description of this talk, you thought there's no way she can cover that. I'm going to talk really fast. So in 1557, Thomas Turner wrote, Though husbandry seem to bring in the grains, yet housewifery labors seem equal in pains. Some respites to husbands the weather may send, but housewives' affairs have never an end. In 1795, Martha Moore Ballard wrote, a woman's work is never done, 
and happy she whose strength led, holds out to the end of the sun's rays. Even famous women with servants felt the pressure. The arranging of the whole house, the cleaning, the children's clothes, and the babies seemed to press on my mind all at once. Sometimes it seems as though anxious thought has become a disease with me from which I am never to be set free. Those words were written by Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1844. So what were these women doing and under what conditions? So let's just look at a few slides here. This is the laundry, which was the most, we'll be talking a little bit about that, the most onerous job. Right again. Okay. 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 And this is something that you may have heard as a child. They that wash on Mondays have all the week to dry. They that wash on Tuesday are not so much awry. They that wash on Wednesday are not so much to blame. They that wash on Thursday, oh, wash in need. And they that wash on Saturday, oh, they're sluts indeed. So there was a whole protocol to doing your wash. Okay, we have a we have a backup plan here. Okay, all right. So this is a typical housewife. I mean, not exactly the housewives, real housewives of Beverly Hills, but nevertheless a real housewife. And you can see she's immersed in the tub, and it's a hard job. Keep going. And this is an, the whole operation with the washboard, with the tubs. Um, with a clothes basket, and there's probably, a, I think, a ringer there somewhere. Keep going. Yeah, I think I can do it. Okay, and this is an outdoors. So you get your fresh air and exercise while you're doing it. This is someone, I don't know if she's washing dishes or washing, you know, laundry inside and ironing. I, as I said, I do a whole top, I do a whole lecture on ironing. Ironing was hard. The sad irons were heavy, really heavy, and they had to be, um, you had to keep moving with them or you'd burn. Cooking. Another stove there. Oh, go back, look at that. <laughs> they put wood in that, some of those burners. Yeah, they were wood burning stoves. The interesting thing is that while stoves were wood burning, men helped, men and boys helped with the housework by chopping the wood. And then as soon as they went to gas and electric, that disappeared. Very busy housewife there. Sweeping. Sweeping was something they had to do frequently. The houses were dusty and they swept. So they're doing their sweeping. After two. All right, so I can read you a very brief description, which <clears throat> John's not fond of, but this is only half of what she did. This is a housewife in 1895, setting tables, clearing them off, keeping lamps or gas fixtures in order, polishing stoves, knives, silverware, tinware, knobs, etc., washing and wiping dishes, taking care of the food left at meals, sweeping, including the Grand Friday sweep, washing, looking glasses, windows, preserving fruits, making jams, jellies, pickles, baking bread, cake, pies, dusting, picking up, making three meals a day, doing the laundry, taking care of the children, taking care of the baby night and day, entertaining company, nursing the sick, patching, darning, knitting, crocheting, braiding, quilting, but let us remember the old saying, if you count the stars, you will drop dead. So wash day would take a full week, day and a half to do. It was the most dreaded day of the week. A research project by the Maytag company reconstructed 19th century washing conditions and estimated that the old wash day was as exhausting as swimming five miles of energetic bus, uh, breaststroke, arm movements and dampness supplying almost an exact parallel. Now there were many different kinds and tubs of washboards as we see. No, not yet. Not yet. Um, everybody had to use soap to do the laundry. And yes, you could make your own soap. It was possible, but it was also available commercially. There were a variety of soaps and each manufacturer obviously wanted the housewife to use his or her particular soap. Initially, trade cards, and these are some trade cards, were used to get out the message. But this was a cumbersome system. Now, women's magazines have been around since the 1830s. I think Bodie's Woman's Book was generally acknowledged to be the first one. However, they became increasingly popular in the 1800s. Advertising and women's magazines were a marriage made in heaven or a marriage made in hell, whichever way you want to look at it. Okay. Forward. Forward. So these are just some old trade cards. 
And I want you to pay particular attention to these early ads because you're going to see all they're doing is advertising the product. By the time we get to the 50s, it's an entirely different story and rather horrifying anyway. So keep, all right, and this is twee, what we used to call twee in England. This is just very, very sweet, okay? Pear soap again with the little boy in the bathtub, the little girl and the dog. Sunlight soap. Um, this is one of my more one of my favorite ads. This is an ivory soap ad, and you'll notice that the gender of the person in the ad is male. Something you're not going to see very much longer. And this was from um, early no late 1800s. So hello, a cake of ivory soap, that's good. I always thought Tom's wife was a sensible woman. Now I know it. Oh, got some in my eyes. It's ivory soap, so that doesn't matter. I've been using this soap from 1882 and I think ivory soap just started in 1878. So it has been around a long, long time. And then he finishes it off. I don't look much older either. Wonderful what an easy conscience and good soap will do. I'm 64 years old. There you go. So this is a man, one of the rare instances of man, yes. Next. Here you go. All right, and this is another one of my favorite ones because they're used, it's a man. This one comes from the, uh, I think this one is about 1898. And they've got the tent there, you can see the man. It floats, so they've got it there. So it's not a woman slaving over a washboard. It's a man out in the woods, so everybody can use things. Now, ivory soap was not too good to use for dishes. Obviously, ivory costs a little bit more than other soaps, but nevertheless, you should be using it. 99 and 44 cent percent pure. Fells Napa has also been around for a long time. And Fells Napa was one of the first to uh, start talking about sanitary and sanitary became very, very big in the 1900s. You want to be sanitary. You could apparently wash baby elephants with it. I don't know. But again, the trade cards and the advertisements were for the most part, very sweet. And here you can wash your clothes with Perline. You can also give your little girl a bath. Let the man wash if they won't get you Perline. Why you needed a man, I have no idea, but let them try it for themselves and see if they don't say that washing with soap is too hard for any woman. Whereas Perlize is the modern way to do it. And this is an early ad, just you know, start your um, deep rinse, let it rinse overnight and there'll be nothing to doing the laundry. Not exactly, but it's an early, Thing that. I like this ad too. 14 hour wives of eight hour men need gold dust washing powder. So here you've got the acknowledgement that the wife is working hard. She's down scrubbing on her hands and knees. She's using a brush. This is a very realistic ad. As woman is the be burden bearer the world over, she should economize her time and strength. Gold dust again. The secret of fine laundering, we get to the point where it's just so easy to do. Um, the little girl is there being trained. Indigo blue washing soap, uh, steel ranges. These were a bear to take care of. Now here they're talking about Von Ami and they're cleaning their ice box with it. Very factual. And that's something I think we all can recognize. Clean the ice box with Sepolio. And the Hoover, I mean, you can do a whole lecture just on vacuum cleaners and we'll come against them again. This one was $140, which seemed like a lot of money in those days, but what do I know? Royal baking powder, absolutely pure. Yeah, it's, when a new person is admitted, that's how you lose control. Oh, it's all the new people coming in. This is, this is a uh, baking uh, powder. No poison, lime, clay, alum of ammonia. Incidentally, a lot of terrible ingredients were used in some of the products. All right, royal baking powder, and this is World War I, and you could substitute baking powder for eggs. Maybe everybody knew that, but I didn't, so there you go. Never tried it. Um, white is the hoarfrost on the pumpkin. This is salt. 
and then the various washing machines that were invented. There was a constant, actually the first ones were invented in the 1700s, but they improved or didn't improve through the ages. And here we've all seen this kind of ad. You can just sit down and do it. It practically does itself. Much leisure for the woman. Well, not really, but anyway. This washer must pay for itself. This is the most convoluted story about how he tried to buy a horse and couldn't buy the horse. And then he decided to sell his washing machines the way the man was selling the horse. There you go. Send no money until you use it for 30 days. The 1900 gravity washer. Nabisco. Nabisco has been around since the 1800s also. All right, this was one of the most disturbing ads. And I will tell you right away that I was very careful when I did the ads and some of them were beyond racist. It isn't, we're not talking Aunt Jemima. Some of them were just horrible. So I tried, I didn't include any of those ads, but this was one from Quaker's Oatmeal, which if you go to their website, you are not going to find it. And it's homes that serve oatmeal, so among the ignorant, we find that not one home in 12 serves oatmeal. Among the highly intelligent, seven eighths are oatmeal homes. House to house canvases of tenement districts in Chicago and New York in these homes found anemic, incapable, underdeveloped, and TB finds its prey. Then we canvass hundreds of homes of educated, competent, the leader in every walk of life. Oatmeal is responsible in almost all of these homes. I have no idea who thought that was a good idea, but when you get to the 50s, you'll see a lot of people who are obviously on a different planet. That is just an appalling ad. Oh, and they canvassed 20,000 doctors. How, one doesn't know, but they did. Claim they did anyway. And that's a more normal Quaker Oats ad. The new crusader shorter hours for women. Uh, pork and beans and canned foods became almost gourmet, something you could serve to anybody. And it saved a lot of, what they stressed was it saved a lot of time for women in the kitchen, which it did. Heinz spaghetti, and please look at this couple. So they're looking at each other, they're happy. She's serving Heinz spaghetti. There's nothing demeaning in it. Um, that's my supper. Somebody overheard a conversation where one man was talking to another man and said, yes, a couple of times a week, I make a uh, dinner out of soup and a little bit of bread, a little bit of tea, and that's my dinner. Campbell's soup again, Heinz, Libby's. Okay. Now, we will talk about this in a minute. So you're all curious. What would elicit such a passionate kiss? Could he have given her a diamond ring, a beautiful necklace, a trip to Europe? You'll find out. It's an interesting and little known fact that from approximately mid 19th century until 1900, there were commercial laundries all over the United States which would do different types of laundry, including delivering a fully washed product. This freed women from one of the most arduous and least rewarding of all household tasks. So what happened to the commercial laundry? You probably guessed by now, the washing machine, that wonderful, wonderful invention, which brought all the work right back into the house. What about other electric appliances, you might well ask? By 1925, half the homes in the US had electricity. A 1914 household manual claimed that electricity would turn a neurotic wife, worn out by housework and domestic duties, into a loving, bubbling over with mirth and joy. So if you haven't bubbled over with mirth and joy lately, I don't know what's the matter. At a flick of a switch, electricity would remove dust, wash clothes, and liberate the housekeeper. So what happened? Ironically, these labor-saving devices tended to increase the amount of work for women by raising the standards of housework. Women ended up cleaning more often, washing more often, and cooking more elaborate meals. Magazine articles and advertisements set higher standards for the women. Vacuum cleaners made the job of taking up the carpets and beating them unnecessary. But how many times did you do that a year? You did that maybe twice. With a vacuum cleaner, women were expected to vacuum once a day. 
there was a growing acceptance of the germ theory, which is how they sold vacuum cleaners and hidden dirt. And we'll be looking at some of these ads. Laundry had once been a chore. Now the housewife was on the front line fighting a constant battle to protect her family from the invisible invaders who might harm her loved ones. Magazines like Ladies Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post connected advertisers with middle-class housewives. These ads became a staple in these magazines. And I have some of these magazines and they're just page after page after page of ads along with fiction. Tidiness, household cleanliness and personal daintiness. And just be glad I'm not doing any personal hygiene ads because those were appalling. Anyway, were the key concepts from women's magazines. Cleaning the house with the right products was the way to protect the family from disease and at the same time show you love them. As an added advantage, housewife, housework, women, housewives could stay in shape by doing housework. So that actually, that, sorry, that, act, that was an ad for, if you guessed it, you get a prize. That was an ad for a vacuum cleaner. And it elicited that passionate response, just what I've always wanted. And this is a common theme, and especially in the 50s, we'll see a lot of that. Um, nature did not make women to perform man's labor. If you really love her wife, get her a gas heater. Don't, you know, don't help her, but just get her a gas heater. Uh, making your children husky. Start in the morning, dressed for the afternoon. And this is the way, again, this is sort of a, a forerunner of the ads in the 50s with the women with their pearls and heels. And here you've got this woman dressed using her vacuum cleaner, which doesn't involve sweeping, which is so easy. The Osito mop, is that not the shiniest floor you've ever seen? And Dutch cleanser to clean the floors. And Healthier homes, again, you're getting into the sanitary. So the germ theory became very, very big. And what is the cost of good natured children? Well, if you want good natured children, you have to feed them oats, even though it might cost a little more. The, uh, here you have again, the theory with the, um, the ad with the hot point servants. So all the electric appliances were your new servants. And this is a roper range, which I think is still around selling the Roper range, fuller brushes. Many of us remember the fuller brush men coming around to our house. Champion of cleanliness. Again, the table that radiates spotlessness. So they're selling, again, they're selling a table here. Back he went, no electricity. And there she's smiling up at her husband who's looking down at her lovingly. Why invite germs? It's something I never thought about, but apparently it was difficult to pop the tops on milk bottles. So you certainly didn't want one, your thumbs didn't belong in it, nor your tarnished forks to say nothing of your dirty ice picks. Woman's work is simplified with this cleanable refrigerator as opposed to all other refrigerators, which apparently were not cleanable. She thought her rug was clean until he showed her all the hidden dirt. And this was sold that each each little dust particle contained millions and millions of germs, and that's how they sold it. And that was the Hoover again in the first ad. Another year's gone by since you thought of buying her Hoover. Why don't you? And of course, if you get that kind of response, every man's going to buy her Hoover. And can we hear a big oh? So even children can use the vacuum cleaner. In the years between the wars, the women's magazine sent a very deliberate message. If her husband and her children were not healthy, if her home was a breeding ground for germs, if she looked old and tired and her children were not gaining weight, then who was to blame? She was. The way to remedy all these ills was to buy the right products. Selling guilt sold products. Psychologists let advertisers know that guilt, embarrassment, and insecurity would sell. Before World War II, however, women's paid labor was largely restricted to traditionally female professions such as typing or sewing or office work in general. 
women were expected to leave the labor force as soon as they had children, if not as soon as they married. World War II changed both the type of work women did and the volume at which they did it. Five million, and this the statistics are a little flaky, five million women entered the workforce between 1940 and 1945. The gap in the labor force created by departing soldiers meant opportunities for women. World War II led many women to take jobs in defense plants and factories around the country. In fact, they were ag the magazine ads were pleading for them, as were the newspapers. These jobs provided unprecedented opportunities for women to move into occupations previously thought of exclusive to men, especially the aircraft industry, where the majority of workers were women by 1943. Most women in the labor force during World War II did not work in the defense industry. They worked in office jobs. The majority took over factory uh, jobs that had been held by women, by men. Although women often earned more money than they ever had before, it was still far less than men received for doing the same job. Nevertheless, many of them enjoyed working. They liked the freedom. They liked the um, sense of competency. And when you finish putting together an airplane, you put together an airplane, you finish cleaning your house and there it is the next day, just looking for. And I just, I just read this yesterday and came across it, but I thought it was so fascinating. Established in 1942 at the behest of Eleanor Roosevelt, emergency nursery schools became the tool to relieve anxious mothers and provide a safe place for children. Both federal and state money were allowed, allocated by an amendment to the Lanham Act, a 1940 law authorizing war-related government grants. Children childcare services were established all over the country and hundreds of thousands of children were served and the mothers could leave their children in a place where they were taken care of and then pick them up after work. These programs um, recognize one kind of domestic labor, child rearing, to enable another kind, paid labor in the domestic economy. The scope of the pro pro uh, project was enormous. Daycare centers were administered in every state except New Mexico. Between 1943 and 1946, spending on the program it exceeded the equivalent of one billion, billion, billion with a B, dollars today. And each year, about 3,000 child care centers served roughly 130,000 children. By the end of the war, it was estimated that between 550,000 and 600,000 children received some sort of care from the program. Nevertheless, it only served about 10% of the children in need. The situation wasn't exactly enviable for the Rosies, particularly in the early part of their war. There were public figures who sought to um, restore women to what they saw was their purported role of caring for their children in the home. A 1943 Gallup poll found that only 30% of husbands unconditionally supported their wives' employment during the war. Once the women returned from the long days of the factory, they were responsible for taking care of the children and they were taken, they had to clean the house. And that even though the women were only paid half of what men were making, they still didn't want to leave their work. They were unceremoniously ejected from the workforce. And this just intrigued me because these women are somewhat older and there they are working on the assembly line. Women were recruited actively. There was all the magazines are filled with ads. There were billboards. They really want, they needed women. They desperately needed women. The women had responsible jobs, difficult jobs and very technical. And this was interesting too. Here's an African woman on the assembly line making probably more money than she'd made before being respected for her job. And then after the war, of course, all these women were told, here's your hat, there's the door and out you go. And I think it was particularly hard on these women who had very few opportunities at that time. Beauty on the job, heaven forbid that women didn't put on lipstick and powder. Um, there were some plants that actually had lessons in makeup. And I read, although I haven't confirmed it, that makeup was never rationed during the war. A lot of things were rationed, but not makeup. A woman's place, so the waves, the wax, and other women's services, 
actively recruited women and women had very, very responsible jobs. Um, these were two women who had worked on, uh, who had worked assembling toy trains. And then when the war came, they were casings for parachutes. Um, my hands are doing kitchen duty right on the home front. So it's acknowledging that even though the woman might not be working outside the house, but who knows that she was taking care of herself because there was this deadly fear that God forbid the men come home and the wife had chapped hands or she didn't look quite as beautiful as she looked before. Time must be rationed by the double duty women. So here you have the two meetings here. Good work, sister. We never figured you could do a man-sized job. Americans women have met the test. So remember these ads, please. Don't miss your great opportunity. Join the waves, the wax, the waves. All of these women were being actively recruited. And again, all the services for women. The more women work, and the more women at work, the, the sooner we will win. And I thought that was just fascinating. We, you all know Rosie the Riveter, so I didn't include that. But isn't that wonderful? The more women at work, so they wanted these women, most of them. And here's one of the programs that they had for children, where children were um, taken care of, they were fed, the mothers didn't have to worry about it. I think they were completely subsidized. So moving right along, we're going to get to what I think is sort of the heart of the talk here. We're going to go into the 50s. Dire predictions besieged those women who insisted on combining employment and a family after the war. Many psychologists championed the idea that women, in order to find true personal fulfillment, had needed to subordinate themselves to their husbands and to be psychologically dependent upon them. And the women's magazines were pushing this. Speaking to Smith College graduates in 1955, Adlai Stevenson emphasized the importance of traditional values. Similarly, Benjamin Spock, who was sort of the person, the Dr. Fauci of his time, I suppose, um, whose child rearing book, Many Parents During the Post-War Years was emphatic in his view of a mother's responsibility to her children. Noting that all children needed a steady, loving person to nurture them, Spock asserted that the mother is the best to give them this feeling of belonging, safety, and surety responsibilities. And we are going there. Um, warnings from social scientists, politicians, and those in business and industry wrote, um, all put statements out that they wanted the women back in the homes where it was good for them. They didn't want them in the workplace. Um, in 1954, an industrial leader who will remain nameless wrote to President Eisenhower, we should all work closely together in an effort to get our women back in the home where they and they more than anyone else can make it the shrine it should be and the solid foundation it has been for building real Americans. The women's magazines, most of them with male editors incidentally, preached the message that a woman's goal should be find, to find Mr. Right, or almost Mr. Almost Right, marry him, raise a perfect family while maintaining a spotless home. Women were strongly encouraged to give up their jobs and produce the family. The idea was promoted by books, magazines, eventually television and advertising. If a woman insisted on going to college, which some did, bless their hearts, she wanted her MRS as soon as she got her BA. Marriage was the ideal and divorce was terrible. The woman was in charge of making her husband dressed and dressed correctly or he might lose his job. His shirts had to be done correctly or there was ring around the collar. She had to feed the family the right foods. She had to participate in the children's school. She had to organize activities. She had to entertain her husband's boss. She had to keep up with current affairs so that she could be a good conversationalist. And she was advised to have her children while she was still young, preferably in her 20s. I had my, I think my second child in 71 and was told I was pretty elderly. There was an, uh, I was 
not. There was an increase in women's magazines with advice columns and articles such as make your mother-in-law adore you and training your daughter to be a good wife. At the same time though, one of the most popular columns was, can this marriage be saved? And I think many of us remember reading that. A 1952 ads for Gimbel's department store asked, what's college? It's where girls who are above cooking and sewing go to meet a man so they can spend their lives cooking and sewing. So if any of you have high blood pressure, beware of these slides. Does your husband yawn at the table? Are you boring him? Well, if so, then you're just not serving him the right soup. This is one of the many absolutely incredible ads. If your husband ever finds out that you're not store testing for fresh coffee, then he can turn you over his knee and God knows what else he can do to you, but it's perfectly acceptable. And this was the wacky, wonderful 50s. Jason Sanborn, don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. Now, remember, these are the same women that we saw five or six years ago holding incredibly responsible jobs in the armed forces in factories. And all of a sudden now, they really can't even cook a meal. But serving the right beer makes everything right. You mean a woman can open? <laughs> this was for, you would never guess it, Alcoa Aluminum. Apparently some lids took, you know, more than a minute or two to open, perhaps, but could a woman open it? You know, this woman was probably right on the assembly line in an aircraft factory, but now she can't even open a bottle of ketchup. Is it always illegal to kill a woman? Whoa, that's a question you probably never asked yourself. His poor secretary didn't want to use the um, postage meter. Incidentally, this is a, not a, fest, a very well endowed uh, secretary. Many of the ads had women who I think had to be, you'll see one, who were extraordinarily well endowed and somehow had had wardrobe misfunctions. But is it always illegal to kill a woman? Get out of the kitchen sooner. Well, yes, and there's hubby there with a child. Maybe if he helped, but that would be asking too much apparently. And this is Bud why she married two men, but as long as she served him the right beer, everything is gonna be okay. Husband pleasing coffee, doesn't matter if you like it or not, but as long as he's happy. Are you woman enough to buy a man's mustard? <sighs> the congratulations dear, but what exactly does an assistant vice president do? Um, this woman may have gone to college. She may have a degree. She probably had a responsible job, but all she's good for now is passing pudding tarts to her husband. Her boss. No, her husband has been, sorry, it's a peanut gallery here. Her husband is the assistant vice president and okay. he's walked in the door and she's, men are a little bit dense sometimes, aren't they? <laughs> keep up the housework and while well, you, you keep down your weight. It's a wife saver. Get a range by uh, Brown equipped with a soil free oven and your wife is going to just be running around the house in beautiful dresses. So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. And what is this for? It's for a cereal with, um, it's a Pep cereal, Kellogg's Pep cereal. But again, gee, honey, you seem to be thriving on cooking and cleaning and dusting. And I'm all tuckered out by closing time. What's the answer? Vitamins, darling. I always get my vitamins. Shh, mom's on the war path. Why is mom on the war path? Remember the ivory soap ads I showed you in the beginning? Well, mom's on the war path because she's tired and if she only knew, remembered to take a bath with ivory before she does all her housework, she would be fine. This won't happen. I was about to divorce you, Gwendolyn because you couldn't make decent tea, but this wondrous brew makes me love you all over again. Oh, lucky day, I changed to Lipton tea. It has brought me back my husband. And I didn't have to look hard to get these ads, trust me. If you ever broke 14 fingernails cleaning an oven, you know why I want this self-cleaning one. Well, of course. It's every time somebody comes in that happens. Somebody comes in. Yeah. 
Okay. Jean, my wife, Jean, is happy, pretty, and pregnant. Boy, am I glad I bought her a new hot point washer and dryer. Now, we don't know if you bought the hot point washer and dryer and she got pregnant or one followed the other. We have no idea. But she's happy, pretty, and pregnant with her new washing machines and dryer. All right, this one threw me. I showed it to Michelle and I couldn't figure it out. I'm a little dense. All right, this man is Richard Deacon, who has seen better days, obviously. He was a very famous actor. He, I had to do some research. He was also the Thermidor um, spokesperson, spokesman. And this woman has had a terrible wardrobe malfunction. And what I didn't get, because I'm a little dense, stacked for convenience. Okay, what can I tell you? Sex sells, and it's certainly sold in the 50s. Stacked in your appliances, stacked. Well, yes, I think we got that, dear. Thank you. Christmas morning, she'll be happier with a Hoover. I mean, what woman wanted to, would want not to, what woman wouldn't want to wake up under uh, Christmas morning and find she has a beautiful Hoover, which is red for the season. Off to the right start. So I don't know if this is a double, if there's two messages in this. It's obviously for the kitchen cabinets, but then you have the little girl here and she's obviously cooking. So off to the right start. I think both these things. Successful marriages start in the kitchen, especially if you're using Pyrex. Remember to be a good wife. It's your fault if he cheats. And that message was hammered home all the time, especially in um, personal products, which were just beyond appalling. Husbands were leaving their wife because they weren't using a good personal hygiene. They were leaving her with a child and marching out the door. I'm shameless the way I hold my men with cake appeal. So they met, she made him an angel food cake and now they have a little child. So there you go. If only we'd all known. This is from Australia, but I couldn't resist this one. The ideal gift for all occasions. Oh, darling, how lovely. I've always longed for a Fowler's Bacola bottling outfit for years and here she is. Canning vegetables. It's canning everything. Okay. How to hold a husband, serve him desserts, glorified with ready whip. And there was no shame at all in using ready made products. Jello was very big and we'll probably come to a jello. After 25, it's hard to catch a man by the time you get to 29. And how do you do that? By using Lux soap for your lingerie, protect your daintiness. So. That was a very disheartening ad, I thought. Your hands, your bathtub for Bonami, both of them deserve the best. This was not technically housekeeping, but if your wife can't cook, don't divorce her. Keep her for a pet and eat at our place. It was a restaurant ad. Happy as can be. What woman wouldn't be happy just to be using Tide in her wash? She's jumping for joy. Tide gets clothes cleaner than any soap. Look at the husband and look at the love between them and his cute little bow tie. It moth proofs the cloth itself. My best suit ruined. Why didn't you use Larvex? Oh, Bill, how stupid of me. I mean, like he couldn't pick up a package of Larvex. Obviously not. And wasn't he checking his suit to see if they had moths? No. But how stupid of me. The Kenwood you bought prepared this wonderful meal. Obviously she had nothing to do with it. She just put it all in the Kenwood and there it was. You certainly clean up fast these days. This is before it had the meaning it has today. Had he helped her, perhaps she would have gotten through it. I mean, just a wild guess, a little bit cleaner, a little bit uh, sooner, but here he is sitting at the table watching her cleaning. Ways to please a lady, a uh, toaster, yes. This was a very problematic ad for me. This is a sheet ad and she seems to be fighting him off. Maybe they're just playing. Maybe it's something else going on. Maybe it's the fuller brush salesman, I don't know. But this is the way sex sells and it's sold huge 
recently in the um, 50s, 60s, well into the 70s. I mean, there are a lot of ads that had nothing to do with housework, so I didn't bring them, but they're just, there's one where a man's stepping on top of a woman who's lying on the floor and he's demonstrating the pants he's wore, wearing. So, but this I think is just one of the very appalling ads that were out there. Look, mommy, anyone would think it was a new tub. So you've got two things here. You've got your Bonami and you've got the little girl cleaning the tub. How to measure your wife for an ironing table. You wanna get the right ironing table for her, very important. Mommy was always so cross. This one just went right over me. And why was mommy so cross for all these uh, panels? She was using the wrong toilet paper, but was too stupid to know that her toilet paper was not soft until somebody introduced her to Waldorf. Dish pan hands, and I think we can all remember Madge, the manicurist, those hands were a scandal. So dish pan hands started early on. Men hate sissy sweet salads, so don't use sissy sweet salads. Um, you call this a salad? Well, it's more like a dessert. And then she changed and used Knox gelatin and everything was fine in their marriage. My husband almost had a fit about my red hands. She was a one date girl. Now, why was she a one date girl? The phone never rang. They could never get a second date. Kellogg's all ran and we won't even go down that road. Reading the male mind. Well, not from what we've seen from some of the other ads, but apparently Cross and Backwell, the right soup. Her Charlie's a regular Romeo since Ivory Lickett helped her hands look young again. And again, the dishpan hands were just very prevalent. His kind of girl, surfed, help, surfed, helped her prove that she was not a scatterbrain after all, like all the other women around in the 50s, all scatterbrains, but then she had surf and she used surf and she, she showed him that she was really right on top of things. To every man who needs a good excuse for getting out of the dishes, yes, buy her a dishwasher. They all want the same thing, my ironing table. I could feel his eyes accusing me. This one just lost me too. Drano, like he couldn't pour some Drano down the drain? No, I mean, look how worried she is was her fault for not using Drano because everything having to do the with the house had to be the woman's job. Heinz ketchup, it's an early ad. Please your man by serving Heinz ketchup. Does coffee bring out the beast in you? You should be using Sanka coffee. And there's a man who obviously is acting very badly, scaring his wife, scaring his children. Your new Hoover, easy cleaning. So this is the Little Housewives Club. So train them early whiter than white. They're even in matching dresses. And you see that. Pyrex again. They're in the kitchen together. The girls learning ironing. This Mother's Day, get back to the job that really matters. Cleaning your tub with Mr. Clean on Mother's Day. Maybe not. Women don't leave the kitchen. We all know that a woman's place is in the home making a man a delicious meal. But if you're still a bachelor and don't have somebody waiting for you, go out to Hardy's for something sloppy and hastily prepared. That's why we can't get a man for Edith. Again, she's not using the right soap for her undies, her dainties. Look, I'm a mother. Yes, my wife is sick in bed. Hopefully she didn't just have another child. And he's just really proud of himself and bragging that he can do this with his washer. All right, this is, I think, one of the talk that I just came, I found this and I'm not really thrilled about it. Women had been put on drugs since the mid or even early um, 19th century. And what happened is that a lot of women 
many women did not feel fulfilled during the 50s. They were unhappy. They were anxious. They weren't meeting the standards that society was setting. They wanted to go back to work and instead they were home. So they were feeling anxious. And you know why she's feeling anxious. She's got the mop, she's got the dustpan, she's got the iron, she's got everything. As men returned from World War II and women re-entered the domestic realm, mother's little helpers like Valium and Librium enabled housewives to cope with the mundane tasks of the housework that they were doing. Though the drugs were originally marketed to both genders, it quickly became clear that an ongoing masculinity crisis would not allow for manly man to pop pills. So by um, 1960, women were being prescribed Valium twice as much as men. The Milltown class of drugs became known solely as women's drugs in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the drugs treated were considered feminine ills. Medical journals from the period depict viciously misogynist cartoons of stereotypically anxious females with vague complaints, and they could all be cured, of course, by taking a pill. And I'll show you a few of these ads. Actually, laudanum was given so much during the uh, 19th century. Okay, we're moving right along here. Housewife headache. Now look how miserable she is there and how happy she is there when she has drugs. Now she can cope thanks to butasol. And she's smiling. Kids are murder. Well, this was a tonic wine. The battered parent syndrome, Milltown. Drugs. Ritalin. Ritalin was applied. Ritalin was prescribed to adult women. Ritalin again relieves chronic fatigue that depresses and mild depression fatigue that fatigues. And here's a woman who had all kinds of problems. Went to see her doctor, and he wrote a prescription. And see how happy she is. She goes shopping. She has dinner. Makes dinner. She's sitting at the PTA meeting, and she falls asleep blissfully. Pregnancy can be made a happier experience with Milltown. And no comment on that one. I hate to kind of leave you <laughs> with a downer, so I'm going to find something else. OK, and somebody's going to say, well, what about the feminine mystique? That was written in 1967. And uh, Betty Friedan wrote to college educated women. And yes, a lot of people were very, very unhappy. So. As promised, this has been a whirlwind tour through a little over 50 years of women's history. Each of these topics is a lecture in itself. I feel there's little doubt that agencies, ad agencies run by men and magazines with male editors did much to demean women during this period. Physicians, perhaps by overprescribing pills, also made their own contribution. However, I always felt it had to come from a higher level. Studies which purported to show that working women were undermining, undermining American values had to be funded. Many academics received funding from government agencies. In addition, no less a personage than J. Edgar Hoover wrote to a woman's magazine in 1994, 1944 that the most important crisis on the home front today is juvenile delinquency, forget about everything else, and that mothers must put their responsibilities to their children and family above all. And we do know that women started returning in great numbers in the 60s. Um, women no longer have to feel that marrying at a young age is the only alternative to them. I'm very proud to say that my sons have been right there from the get go with their family. There's never been a clear division and I'm sure that's the same of all your children too. I'd like to end with something that a woman wrote, a 15 page paper, which I have in 1911. Nature has specialized woman for childbearing. It is society which has specialized her for housework. So let me just show you. This is somebody did, very clever person, did reimagined ads Christmas morning. He'll be happier with a Hoover. Get out of the kitchen sooner. So thank you for your attention. Um, I don't know, we have a little time for some um, questions. If we don't get all the questions, I do live at Moldau. I'm very accessible. And my email is just diane.clarebout at gmail.com. So I will be available. So I don't know if there are any questions, Michelle. So we have a comment from Liz. She says, how could taking care of the children be assigned as one task that can be one of the most demanding? Well, this was just the 
attitude. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure if that's in, in relation to the drugs or what's that in relation to. We all know what taking care of children is like. We've all, well, most of us have raised children. We know how hard it is. But that, well, that's why they were being prescribed too. They were being prescribed Milltown and the other drugs. Was that an answer to the question? I wasn't sure I quite understood it. I think it was more, more of a comment. Um, a comment, oh yeah. Well, you can see during the 50s, they had to get those women out of the factories. They had to get them back home and they had to put a guilt trip, a tremendous guilt trip on them too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's no question about it. Those of us who've had children would certainly say, yes, it's hard. <laughs> Especially if you just had voice. That was even Another hard. comment from Phyllis says, what a great presentation. We've come a long way, but more to do. So wasn't that another ad for cigarettes, women saying- I think there were cigarettes and there's huge, oh, the cigarette ads were appalling. There were physicians serve, uh, smoking cigarettes and there were uh, pregnant women smoking cigarettes. And you saw the Milltown ad there where, you know, this was a pregnant woman. So yes, the cigarette ads were just, that was to show equality, okay? You could smoke the same, you could kill yourself just as easily as men did. Diane, if you can stop your screen sharing, then maybe we can see everybody on gallery view. Oh, and, John, you want to help me with that? Everybody raises their hand. To, um, okay, my, 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 the man behind the screen is coming over and is going to help me. There we go. Okay. So, Rosalind, you have your hand up. If you unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask a question. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to see some people oh, have a question. I'm going to make a comment, an observation. Uh, we were at one time so careful to keep the house clean, sanitary. And my son at that point said, mom, show me a, a dirty kid and I'll show you a happy boy. <laughs> you know, he would have none of this. <laughs> yeah, one of my friends are I see him. Fabio, we've got people here from Italy. Can I say hello to Fabio and Laura? Hello, Diane. Diane? Yeah, this is wonderful. Happy, and, Happy uh, to see you. All the best. Hak Sameach. Hak Sameach. Terrific. Oh, it's <laughs> wonderful to see. I should do, oh, I'm not going to do it more often, but it's just nice to see all these people I haven't seen in a year. Um, were there any more questions? So we have a comment from Liz. It says, I do notice that it continues to be women who are featured in cleaning product ads even today. And women's magazines continue to use the insecurity to promote products. I think that's true. I, um, I did get a good housekeeping ad and I looked at the ads there and they were, you know, pretty innocuous. They were selling the products. So I think the difference is that they're not demeaning women the way they used to and women are not considered stupid and brainless the way they were in the ads in the 50s. And again, there was a, there was a method to that madness. These were very bright women and they had to make them feel guilty about uh, not staying home with their children. So I, I am guessing that in the beginning in these marketing agencies, it must've been mostly men. So do you think things have changed now that there are more women in marketing? Oh, I think there, well, there's more sensitive men maybe. And I think there's definitely more women in marketing. There's women in every career now. I mean, our daughters, our granddaughters, our great granddaughters have something to look forward to other than just getting married and staying at home. And in the 50s, that was, it's, people did go against that, but they were um, outliers, I think. They, they were not widely accepted. I mean, I can remember 1969, I tried, I had a play group for my one of my sons and, um, one of the women went to work and everybody looked askance and by 74 when I had my last child I couldn't even get a play group so things happened that quickly and I think advertising went along with it too and women I think wouldn't buy a product that was demeaning I mean although it's hard to come in um, it's hard to come up to the level of the Thermidor ad <laughs> and if you watch it just look up sexist ads on the web and you will see so many for all, all products, which definitely did not need that kind of advertising. All you had to do was tell what the product did, but instead women were put down constantly. Um, the feminine hygiene ads were horrible. Um, there's one of a woman lying on the floor next to her husband's shoe, cuddling it. I mean, they were just kinky and they got away with it. I mean, aside from the 
oatmeal ad that I read you, the very inappropriate Quaker oatmeal ad, that you didn't see that very much during the other period. So we have another comment from Phyllis. She says, I had great role models a Rosa the Riveter who became a realtor in San Francisco and a lawyer who learned law by working for a lawyer. She became very famous. Yeah, and it's wonderful when people did, or even better if they're mothers, but that didn't happen to, I mean, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York and my mother didn't work until very, very late. I mean, we had left home and then some, so it wasn't that common. And um, divorce was just something that women didn't, didn't do in the 50s. Does anybody else have a question or comment? You want to reach hand? Esther, Esther Ehrman, do you want to ask? You're muted. Yeah, um, one of the things I was thinking about um, how um, convincing and pervasive the advertising is. Um, as a mom in the 70s, I fed my kids margarine. I would not have butter in my house. And then when my son went as an exchange student to England um, and, you know, the, the 90, early 90s, he said, mom, you won't believe what these people eat, they eat butter. And they walk around and they're healthy. And I'm saying, you know, that happened, right? That was right. Yeah, we lived in England too. But somehow we, you know, our kids survived. I had, there was an ad I found for spraying your cabinets with GDT, which I thought was just a bit out there. Henry Cooper has a, Go ahead, Hank, you have to unmute yourself. Hank. Hank, you have to unmute yourself. Hank? I can't hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Or, or write your question or comment in the chat. Or if you're on a computer, press down the space bar. Yeah. Uh. That's great, yes. Okay, go ahead, Hank. When I was young, I was always interested in why the alternate spelling of ketchup was C-A-T-S-U-P. Right. I, I don't know that. I'd be happy to look it up for you and let you know, Hank. I know where you live. So let me make a note of that and just look up the alternate spelling of ketchup. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And uh, so we did record this, this presentation today. We should have it up on the website at some point. I will let you know about that. And uh, let's see, I have one more question here from Kathleen. Did you run into many ads from the 60s, 70s that featured the housewife's fantasy of a brawny man or genie from a bottle who rescued housewives? I didn't really go in beyond the 50s. I would be, it'd be interesting to see, but I know that a lot of the ads were inappropriate to say the least, way into the 70s. Well, I mean, just think of the, um, the 60s and the 70s, the Playboy clubs, which were big in some areas and the sexism that they were, and then later Hooters. So it isn't as though we've gotten rid of sexism. I think ads are better than they were, much better than they were downright boring almost, but that's the way it should be. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. In the World's Fair in New York, uh -huh. I, I don't remember what year that was, but it was in the 50s, wasn't it? Well, GE put on a huge presentation of the kitchen of the future appealing yeah. to women. It was strictly for women. All the men would walk out. Right. It was in the 60s. <laughs> in the 60s, yeah. I mean, that was still very prevalent. I stopped in the 50s because I had to stop somewhere. And I think those were the most egregious ads. But the 60s, the 70s, and depending which magazines you read, I'm sure there are some men's magazines that continue to uh, run ads that were somewhat inappropriate, demeaning to women. So we have some information here from Sharon. It says, I think catsup came from the Chinese word kayup, which means tomato sauce, or it could be an Indonesian word also, kejup. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But thank you, Sharon. Not many of us knew that. I'm so excited. I'm seeing my family. I'm seeing friends. <laughs> it's wonderful. I advise everybody to do this. 
Well, I would like to invite everybody to uh, put on your video and uh, unmute yourself and give Diane a great round of applause for the presentation for sure. today. So thank you, it's Diane. totally my pleasure and I enjoyed it and I hope you got something out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was so different and enlightening and, and you know, disturbing at times, but fun to see all those photographs. So thank you all for coming today. It was so nice to see everyone. And uh, for next week, we have Dr. Patrick Hunt, who will be talking about the history of wine in California. And he's always wonderful. So hope thank you'll you. join us and um, have some math to everybody. And thank you again, Diane and John also for helping out with all the technical. And, and thank you, Michelle. Thank, thank you, thank you. Very lovely presentation. Well, very, <laughs> very interesting. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Bye. 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 It was wonderful. I love you. And how to do this? And can you see me? We can talk to the entire left.